Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2016. Stand by for action. Want new bonus chapters? Of course! Everyone wants bonus chapters! If you like what you see in here, give us a super thanks. Buttons are below every video. Every super thanks goes directly to new science fiction. Don't miss our action premieres where you can enjoy the story live. Want to rank up and get special recognition? Become a channel member. You might even become an honorary Skywatch Marine. Join us, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like and comment, and don't forget to visit the bookstore where you will find my latest books and one-of-a-kind officially licensed gear. All ahead, battle speed! Chapter 1 All right, Hunter, let's have it. Deep space pilots called the Jupiter Skyway approach port Max Boomtown. The value of the cargo passing through the facility on any given day could easily rival the total output of one or more colonies along the reach. The man in charge of it all was a no-nonsense merchant marine inspector by the name of Jeremiah Fubing. Honestly, inspector, I can't believe you of all people could think I would violate fleet contraband policy. Jason Hunter was standing with his hands folded behind his back and wearing his most unthreatening expression along with his flawlessly pressed and shined Skywatch officer's uniform. Around the inspector's office hummed the vital operations of Merchant Customs Authority. Max Boomtown was one of the largest civilian freight inspection stations in the core sector, often processing more than 100 ships a day ranging in size from personal interplanetary cruisers to billion-ton star trains. Sure you don't want to come to the party? Hunter asked, trying to distract the overworked customs officer. Inspector Fubing sat at his desk, fiddling with fiddly scraps of paper. He believed computers were 100% of the reason his numbers failed to add up correctly, so he kept all his records in writing. His prodigious weight scarcely fit between his sagging desk and the wall. The office looked like an 18th-century British librarian's closet, with tiny wooden drawers, brass cabinet fittings, and enough accounting books to sink a small rowboat. Out the window behind him, Hunter could see the line of ships docked for inspection. His shuttle was the closest and the smallest by a factor of at least six. Hunter, every time you come through here, we go through the same dance. You and I both know you're carrying illegal booze. I call you on it. You deny it. Then I have to decide if I want to send a squad of officers out to climb through your ship deck by deck looking for it. The next time I'm just going to shoot you. It's less paperwork. Get that juiced up hot rod off my docks. Fubing shoved a customs clearance into Hunter's hands and waddled towards the door, wheezing impatiently. It's going to be a bash, Inspector. Sure you won't. Get out, Hunter! Fubing shouted across the bustling customs office. Just one drink? He called back. Out! The voice echoed. Moments later, Hunter spied his favorite Boomtown official. She went by the name Tissily, and she had been persuaded on multiple occasions to let the captain skate by when the inspector wasn't looking. He snuck up on her desk and appeared from behind her overhead cabinets. Hi, Hunter grinned. Miss me? You get out of here, Tisali whispered urgently. The last time you and that, that creature almost got me fired. The captain was leaning over the half-height wall to look down on her desk. He picked up her tablet and flipped through the pages nonchalantly. I see you're still reading those naughty books with the shirtless pirate captains on the covers, Hunter teased as he raised an eyebrow. Ooh, the pirate has a tomato. Tisali ripped the tablet out of his hands and put it in a drawer. Do I have to call security? Oh, don't be like that, the captain replied, reclining his chin on his arms and overdoing the smoldering look. I was going to invite you to our party. Honora got her SR ticket. We're flying into Scaries for a drink and dinner and maybe a little something extra. That sounds like something you would have jumped at before you turned into Tisali the worker bee. She actually hesitated looking into the captain's dancing eyes and gazing at his sandy boyish hair for a moment and remembering how many times he was the only reason she smiled. Then she remembered the time she had to be bailed out of jail half-dressed and her expression darkened again. I have plans. Oh, well, I tried. Say hi to your mom for me. Hunter sauntered off. Hey, Mike, how's the new sled? Tissily watched as the captain greeted at least five more people before walking out into the soft lock. She quickly suppressed her second thoughts and went back to her rows and columns of numbers. Chapter 2 
Neek, what's the good word? Hunter removed his coat and stored it in the inboard bay before donning the upper half of his flight suit. Welcome aboard, Captain. Status of Command 1 is nominal, the pleasant electronic female voice responded over the shipwide intercom. The Argent Command computer's name was Dominique, but Hunter preferred fewer syllables, so it was quickly shortened to Neek. What's the weather forecast on this dark and starry day? The Jupiter primary is relatively quiet, no unusual readings to a distance of point one. Very good. Engage communications auto systems and begin flight checks. Hunter closed the door to Command One's aft storage. The boxes of scotch, rum, and various brews were stacked eight high. Affirmative. Auto systems engaged. The captain switched his comlink. Hunter to Argent. A brief pause. Hunter pulled on his flight suit pants and began working with the pressure seals on his boots. Argent, Ensign Walls here. Walls? Who's my officer of the watch today? Er, uh, uh, I am, sir. The young officer's voice was tremulous. It was pretty clear he hadn't been in command of the watch for long, and it was also pretty clear he wasn't used to addressing the skipper in person. Are you taking good care of my ship, Ensign? Yes, sir. Outstanding. Plot a course to Jupiter 5 and give me a best speed ETA. Soft voices could be heard in the background, just loud enough to trigger the pickups in Ensign Walls's high-gain microphone. Sir, uh, sir, the ETA to Jupiter 5 is nine hours safe speed. Very well, Argent. Plot your course and bring the ship about. Command 1 will rendezvous at the Autonav Beacon. Hunter out. After bounding into the pilot's seat, Hunter expertly activated the magnetic locks on his flight harness, sealed the ship's environmental controls, and cleared the moorings. Neek was busy negotiating a departure vector which the computer knew from experience the captain would ignore. The main idea was simply to let space lane traffic control know when Command 1 was going to rocket into the approach and blast its way free of the launch corridor. STC, this is Command 1 requesting jets and standing by. The turbine-like whine of the shuttle's mains filled the ship with the thrum of fusion-energized power. Hunter skillfully tapped out the remaining configuration commands and flexed his gloved hands as the vessel's maneuvering controls unlocked and rotated into position on either side of his flight couch. HUD readouts glowed on the inner surface of the viewport, and Hunter's tack suit stabilized pressure and life support with a cheerful bell-like sound. Hunter activated the dock lock release, breaking the last physical connection between the shuttle and Jupiter station. Command 1, this is Space Lane Traffic Control. Navigate Departure Lane 1 4. Autonav is disengaged. Have a nice flight. We are free and clear to navigate, Captain, Dominique calmly announced. Affirmative, STC, Hunter replied. The sleek white shuttle pivoted weightlessly. Its pilot punched the maneuvering thrusters and blasted free of the ship line. Captain Hunter nudged the lateral flight controls. The vessel banked to starboard. He throttled the engines up to one quarter power. His ship silently accelerated as the large control bank numbers indicating relative velocity spun higher. The tiny ship slid into the station's electronic launch corridor just ahead of an immense commercial freighter. Captain Hunter pinged their navigational comm frequency with a friendly greeting before pulling away into open space. Chapter 3 The newest crop of hotshot officers readily agreed there was something almost magical about the way modern warships were constructed. Jason Hunter had fallen deeply in love with the third-generation ships of the line the first time he had seen the design, and Argent was most assuredly the prettiest girl at the prom when it came to the captain's corps and their bragging rights. Hunter was a self-admitted romantic. He often opined there was no more glorious creature in all creation than a maiden resplendent in all her finery. This was usually interpreted by colleagues and rivals alike as a fanciful metaphor for the unblemished Citadel-class Hull 740. Command 1 approached the enormous weapons platform from her port quarter. He tapped the transponder indicator with a gloved finger in the Academy-approved manner to make absolutely sure his shuttle was transmitting multi-frequency encrypted friendly signals on all of Argent's pickups. He knew what his baby was capable of if she detected an unauthorized scanner contact inside her command zone, and he knew well the only thing worse than being vaporized by your own ship's point defense was knowing that your ship had opened fire on 18 cases of 30-year-old scotch. Green and white running lights glimmered. A ship of the line was a vessel engineer's expression of sheer power. The shape was meant to convey an intimidating potential for destruction. Her formidable engines, mighty main batteries, and lithe energy weapon emplacements were breathtaking even for someone not acquainted with the design genius.
The soaring main hull gave the enormous vessel a majestic profile. Her sweeping triple flight decks were as innovative as they were formidable. Hunter's ship could launch and recover squadron after lethal squadron of smaller ships ranging from deep space fighters to surface mechs. Argent was brand new. There were some inboard spaces where crew recruits swore they could still smell new paint. Some of the officers had to admit they had never seen so much expensive hardware in such pristine condition all in the same place before. Hunter had made a point of walking the decks and visiting every compartment, berth, and space within hours of receiving orders to take command. He knew a 23-year-old skipper already had his share of challenges to overcome. Breaking tradition would be nothing more than tempting luck, and all captains, young or old, knew one thing about Skywatch duty. Luck was at least as important as everything else put together. Hunter had his enemies. At least three flag officers directly opposed his rapid promotions, but when faced with the realities in his jacket, that gleaming Sky Shield Legion decoration on his uniform, and his short, fiery billet as flight leader of Yellow Jacket 9, where he became the first ace fighter pilot under the age of 20 in fleet history, even the most shrill objections were inevitably quieted. What he had was the respect of the men and women he had fought with. There were some things even Skywatch Academy couldn't teach, and there were some collars where a captain's insignia belonged, age be damned. There were also some ships that needed a crew up to the task of following a captain like Jason Hunter into battle. The officers that recommended his promotions had high expectations, and Hunter knew that no matter how accomplished his crew became, he needed even better officers. Reassembling those officers was the captain's current mission. After expertly landing Command 1 on starboard flight deck 3, Hunter powered down and disengaged his shuttle's controls. The atmosphere normalized and the environmental computers balanced pressure between the shuttle interior and the crowded, magnetically sealed seven-acre flight deck before the airlock indicators switched to green. Hunter's comlink went live, and the familiar voice of the ranking crew chief sounded from the omnidirectional crystal speaker in the captain's uniform collar. What have you got, Skipper? I've got the hard stuff, Chief. Hunter punched the hatch interlock and opened the shuttle's side door. Duncan Buckmaster was always a welcome sight. He was at least twice Hunter's age with the service stripes to prove it. Within an hour of learning, the captain had requested his assignment to one of the most prestigious commands in the entire line. He had become Hunter's staunchest ally. The speed with which he shaped up the Argent's flight crews was the stuff of legend. He was three weeks from mandatory promotion to Master Chief Petty Officer, the highest non-commissioned Skywatch rank. Good to have a non-trainee command officer back aboard, sir, Duncan said as he activated the shuttle's disembark ladder. Everyone's been nervous as a new bride's first Thanksgiving around here with the junior division in charge, and I'm starting to feel like a dad left home with all the kids. Master Chief, I can only promise you this. When I finally round up my truant officers, you just might long for the days of the junior division. I've got some of the fleet's biggest delinquents waiting for us on Jupiter 5, and we're going to blow the roof off of Scaries. Hunter slapped Buckmaster's shoulder. Why don't you take the hop down with us? We'll set you up with a stake and a stein and tell some story. I appreciate that, sir, but you told me before we left Oil Can City you wanted paladins, T-Hawks, and wildcats ready for action in two weeks. Well, today is day ten. I'll take that stake if you'll take two out of three. Point conceded, Master Chief. Let's call it a rain check. Hunter turned and pointed as he made his way to the magneto lifts. I owe you one. If I don't deliver in a week, you have an open invitation to the captain's table for dinner. Much obliged, sir. Where do you want all this hooch? Just put it somewhere customs can't find it in case we get waylaid. Hunter synchronized his personal chronometer with shipboard time and jogged to the flight level lifts. This was one party he couldn't be late for. Chapter 4 Captain on the bridge. The two dozen officers and crew hastened their activities as the battalion marine corporal stationed at the bridge entrance announced Jason Hunter's arrival on deck one. Walls, since I don't have an XO, how would you like the job for the next nine hours? Hunter asked abruptly as he took his command chair. Aye, sir, the ensign replied nervously. Very good. Get me a flight operation status report. Comms, bring us up on the JA and get me this morning's priority messages. Ops, I need deck status. Neek, give me an intraship channel to engineering. Helm, report our position. A chorus of quiet eyes followed each of Hunter's orders. 
The activity was well rehearsed and efficient, even if the crew members themselves were unusually nervous. The combination of their sudden assignments, the new hardware, and the confidence of their boyish captain combined to make the bridge of the Argent seem like a training exercise, even though it was clear this was anything but. Our position is 290 miles bearing 131 Mark 60 relative the Boomtown Tower, course plotted for Jupiter 5 and on the board, ETA 8 hours 53 minutes. Hunter waited an appropriate interval while the activity bustled around him. He pretended to check items off a tablet before he spoke. Well done, Ensign. Walls almost blushed. Thank you, sir. Do as fine a job getting me that flight status and you'll be on your way to an official EXO's command. The Ensign startled himself out of his self-congratulatory haze and turned back to the wraparound display of his vessel's intricately mapped and scrolling flight deck operations status reports. Intraship channel open, Dominique replied. Madison, are the boilers lit? Like jack-o'-lanterns, sir, came the snappy reply. Outstanding. Can you give me best speed four by four? And then some, sir. Very well, stand by to engage the mains. Bridge out. Operations reports deck status one through thirty-four green. Crew secured for all flight modes. The operations officer could have easily passed for a recent high school graduate. In fact, the more Hunter thought about it, he realized she probably was precisely that. Helm, engage main engines and stand by to navigate. Aye, sir. Helm answering. Mains at your command. The comms officer spoke up. I have one priority message, sir. It's from Commander, DSS Fury. Captain Hunter had actually taken a breath to issue his next command before he seemed to deflate like an attacking Spartan general interrupted by a crying infant. Let me guess, he sighed. My long-suffering darling sister wants a word? It's from Commander Hunter, sir. Very well. Open a channel. The blue and white Pegasus emblazoned emblem of Task Force Perseus filled the Argent's main view screen. Well, well, Hunter began with a sarcastic tone. A task force. Haven't we reached the rare air? Commander Jace Hunter's eyebrow-raised expression replaced the circular task force banner. Her trademark garrison cap looked especially intimidating when magnified to fit the Argent's forward bulkhead. You got something to say about my ship, sir? I wouldn't dream of it, Commander. Several of Argent's bridge crew looked back and forth between the view screen and their skipper. Were they not opposite genders, most would have immediately agreed the two ship captains could easily be mistaken for one another. My crew is just now realizing I have a twin sister, Jason said in a deadpan tone. I already explained to Fury's bridge officers you were a lab experiment gone terribly wrong, sir, Jace replied. I just wanted to send along my compliments to Dr. Doverly. You will remember to give her the card I had flown from one end of known space to the other, won't you? Of course. Do I look like a heartless lout? Permission to speak freely, Captain? As you were, Commander. By the way, since when have you been flying your own flag? Fury took the point at Gitarren Station last month. When the task force arrived, they were down three ships. I was senior officer present, so I got the job. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Now the important question, have you built me a robot that can clean a room yet? With all due respect, sir, my minibots are not cleaning utensils. Now if you'd like to borrow Echo for a couple of weeks, I'm sure she could get Argent's house in order. No, for the love of all that is green and growing, don't you dare let that siren-obsessed wheeled alarm clock anywhere near this ship. My medical officer would have to submerge me in tranquilizers to stop the nightmares. Belay the request for a cleaning bot, just... Draw me up some ideas for a swabby machine or something. I'll do what I can, Captain. Fury out. The bridge crew did their best to look serious, but several of them were too busy covering up their smiles and desperately trying not to sputter a laugh. Operations reports Argent space lanes secure. Navigation cleared for all flight modes. Thank you, acting exo walls. The ensign blushed again and tried to sit up straighter without inadvertently pulling a muscle. Helm, navigate course 131, Mark 60. SNS screens to 15% power. All ahead full. Aye, sir. Helm answering. Mains engaged. All ahead full. Captain Hunter reclined in his command chair and toggled the main view screen to a forward view of space and the overlay of the navigational corridor to their destination. A clock began ticking the ETA down from 8 hours and 53 minutes in the upper right corner of the screen. The five-million-ton battleship surged forward and accelerated towards the Jupiter system's fifth planet. Chapter 5 
Jason Hunter walked into Scary's Bar and Grill like Bill Russell walking into Boston Garden. Even people who had no idea who he was acted like they knew him. His argent baseball cap with his rank insignia made it clear to any and all fleet personnel who he was, and although technically regulations didn't require them to salute him off-duty, many did anyway just out of respect for his brief but colorful reputation as a pilot, flight leader, and now battleship captain. He smiled and greeted everyone warmly, as if already celebrating a big victory. It made people feel like they were participating in the mystique. Simon Scary Huntington was the proprietor of Fleet Inn, as it had come to be known over the years. The proximity of Jupiter Station made the establishment the obvious stop-off point before ships moved on to deliveries, other assignments, or back to Jupiter to pick up ships that couldn't be inspected right away. Huntington's nickname came from his tall, gaunt appearance and shock of black hair. Most joked he could play the part of Frankenstein's monster without makeup. That didn't stop him from doing himself up as a monster every Halloween, of course. Nevertheless, he was often the most human-looking creature in the building. He shook hands with Captain Hunter and made arrangements to store the down-low shipment of bottle service Hunter had delivered aboard Command One. Over the years, the fleet's favorite bar had grown large enough to accommodate several hundred. There was a full-fledged dining room, banquet facilities, gaming areas for card players, a makeshift dance floor of sorts, and, of course, one of the most well-stocked bars in a radius of ten light years. Scary serves it all, was the slogan. Even so, Huntington still tolerated Captain Hunter's occasional insistence on bringing his own adult beverages from time to time. He and his party could never drink several dozen cases, of course, but forgetting what they didn't drink and leaving it behind was Hunter's way of paying for the privilege. It was also the only place in 20 light years where a Skywatch officer could get away with an act that would be blatantly illegal pretty much everywhere else in space. Jupiter 5 was officially neutral under interstellar law. It had completely independent law enforcement and explicitly prohibited both military and civilian officials from exercising any jurisdiction on the surface or in orbit. The ruling council was also careful to bar extradition outside the system. Aside from its own governance, the only law that functioned on Jupiter 5 was bounty hunting, which was also illegal but rarely enforced, absent an extraordinary lack of discretion. There were three tables reserved for the Argent Party. Hunter had barely slid into one of them and ordered his trademark drink in an old-fashioned glass from his own reserve when an attractive, skimpily-dressed young woman poured herself like honey on his lap and put her arms around his neck. You never call. The girl's piercing blue eyes were painted with flawless black mascara and light green highlights. Her pouting expression gave her a kittenish look, and her long, feather-decorated, brandy-colored hair added just the right touch. She was toned and tight and seductively curvy in all the right places. She wore a black and brown tactical harness tailored to reveal all the smooth, caramel-colored skin possible. It was decorated with a number of ominous insignia and set off by a pair of skin-tight tack suit pants that hugged her shapely form in ways that were flat-out unfair. She was also armed with at least three weapons, two of which Hunter guessed were illegal. Hunter also guessed she had at least one unannounced knife hidden in a boot or glove as well. And you broke jail. Oh, Jason, you didn't even bother to look after me. All the charges were dropped. Those mean convoy merchants never even showed to testify. Besides, nobody wants to see me exiled. She smiled, walked her fingers up Hunter's t-shirt and drew little circles on his neck with a perfectly manicured nail. Last I checked, you and that gang of yours were facing six dozen counts of piracy. You wouldn't have been exiled. You would have been thrown to the wolves. You wouldn't let that happen, would you? She blinked and focused her gaze directly into Hunter's eyes. If you didn't have me to chase, whatever would you do for fun? Her lips were scarcely a few millimeters from his. He noticed the mesmerizing scent of her alluringly understated perfume. Next time I'll just lock you in my brig, Cerilia. Hmm. She gathered her shoulders together and snuggled as if wrapping herself in a warm blanket. As delicious as that sounds, it would put a bit of a crimp in my style. She gave Hunter a mocking pouty frown. Hey, this is a family bar. Lucas Moody shouted. The burly Marine officer stood at Hunter's table and gave Cerilia more than a lingering glance. He wore fatigues and a black and silver Camp Oscar boxing team t-shirt. The Argent's captain responded with a scoundrel's smirk. Major, I don't think you've ever been properly introduced. This is Cerilia Lorleon. 
She's wanted for piracy, bootlegging, smuggling, claim jumping, and just about everything else in the core system's interstellar code short of insurrection. Captain Lorleon, this is Major Lucas Moody, my paladin squadron leader. Charmed. Lorleon gave Moody a smile that made him think the wrong thing. Captain, he replied with a textbook courteous nod. Then he glanced at Hunter, who offered him no clues on what to do next. To avoid any uncertainty, the Major chose to take a seat and grab a bowl of mixed legumes and crackers, making a point of not looking in Hunter's direction. I'm also wanted for kidnapping, Cerelia purred, lifting her knees together and giving Hunter a squeeze. You haven't killed anyone, have you? he asked with a raised eyebrow of his own. She nuzzled Hunter's ear with her lips and whispered, Far as you know. She slid off his lap and gave him a teasing look over her shoulder. Hunter leaned sideways, playfully tried to swat her backside and missed. Cross the line, Captain, and I'm going to lock you up. Ooh, I can't wait. See you out there, Captain, she giggled. A moment later, Cerelia slipped into the crowd and vanished. Hunter returned to his drink and smiled the smile of a guy remembering that particular girl. Is this where I change the subject, sir? Moody asked without taking his eyes off the half-emptied cracker bowl. No, Moo, this is where you get yourself something and take a drink with your captain. Ray, hey! Hunter whistled through his fingers. A dizzy-looking, overworked barmaid looked through the crowd in his direction. Get my mech commander a stein and fill it with a beer-like substance. Let's get this party started. Moments later, a half-gallon of sudsy brew landed with a thud on the wooden table in front of the Major. His eyes widened at the sight of so much golden happiness in such a huge, quasi-transparent ceramic container. That's not a beer. That's a glass of heaven, Moody exclaimed. Let it never be said the captain of the Argent doesn't take good care of his men. Hunter held up his glass and toasted the Major. Moody responded in kind, and the two officers took matching swigs. Jason's internal radar snapped on. He had heard something but was still trying to separate it from the surrounding noise when Major Moody rose from his seat and looked across the room. Hunter stood. Although he wasn't quite as tall as the imposing Marine officer, he could still see two Skywatch personnel engaged in what looked like some kind of altercation at a table filled with drink glasses and snacks and surrounded by a dozen more Skywatch NCOs and crewmen. A junior lieutenant was standing over an exhausted-looking man who was wearing the distinctive uniform of a Skywatch petty officer. It didn't look like a healthy conversation to Jason or Lucas. Hunter made his way through the crowd and arrived at one end of the table just in time to hear the lieutenant shout the word, Hey! as if trying to get the petty officer's attention. Lucas walked up behind the lieutenant and scanned the table. He rapidly concluded all the present ranks combined wouldn't add up to enough authority to change the thermostat. Hunter remained quietly in plain view as he observed and noted the officer's tone of voice. The word badgering came to mind. The NCO looked close to unconsciousness, head bent towards the table. Major Moody took another look around. It reminded him of a room full of frat guys halfway through a keg. One of them started to light a cigarette. The Major had had enough. Attention on deck! The only thing that broke the relative silence that followed was the dish that tumbled across the floor, scattering crumbs and broken crackers everywhere. Seventeen people stood at rigid attention. More than a few of them had narrowly avoided involuntarily relieving themselves at the sound of the Major's command voice. Pale, straining faces stared straight ahead. Hunter watched as the petty officer tried to get to his feet and caught the man just before his buckling knees let him drop to the floor. Jason helped him back to his chair and tried to lean down to see the man's face. Petty officer, are you all right? I'm at the tail end of a 40-hour run, sir. Permission to stand at ease. Hunter looked up at the Major. Why don't you take a couple days' liberty on me, petty officer? Get some rest. You look like hell, Hunter said. Thank you, sir. I will, sir. His voice sounded like it required most of his remaining strength to speak. Hunter stood and directed his attention to the lieutenant. How does that sound? The petty officer was absent without... I don't care what the problem was, mister. You all start from one again in two days, is that clear? Yes, sir. Very well. Carry on, lieutenant. Moody took another look around with glaring eyes. Then he gave the order to stand down. The two officers returned to their own table. By the time Lucas had wiped the suds off his upper lip from his next swig, a strangely quiet girl was rounding Hunter's table. In her hands was a small blinking electronic device of some kind. She was oblivious to everything else in the room, but she did take a seat at Hunter's table. Yeely, Hunter said pleasantly. 
The girl nodded. She was dressed in a Skywatch senior lieutenant's uniform with a rare red and black orbital combat engineering patch insignia on one shoulder and several decorations it would have taken most officers at least one or two glances at the metal book to identify. She wore a garrison cap similar to Hunter's sister and had longish white hair. She went back to fiddling with her little blinking toy. What can I get you? Earplugs, Moody grinned. How about a drink? She shrugged. Hunter gestured and whistled again. Moments later, a festive, brightly colored drink was placed in front of the young woman. She ignored it. Dr. Doverly, I presume? Standing before Hunter in an impeccably pressed Medical Corps commander's uniform was an attractive auburn-haired young woman. Her expression was pleasant, but it was clear from the look in her eyes she was possessed of a formidable intellect. Jason, it's so good to see you again, she replied graciously. The two officers hugged each other like long-lost friends. Oh, before I forget and encourage my lovely sister to have me court-martialed here. Jason picked the card up from the table and gave it to Honora. She opened it and smiled as she read the greetings, congratulations, and many signatures of the Fury officers and crew. Oh, this is wonderful, thank you, she gushed. I'll send a communique the very next chance I get. Hunter noticed the new gleam of the coveted golden search and rescue badge on Honora's uniform. The training the device represented was among the most feared and respected in the fleet, second only to special warfare training. Major Moody greeted her with an overwhelming bear hug. Glad to see you, Doctor. Hunter was busy greeting more acquaintances while Yili shook Honora's hand and smiled. It was the first time the lieutenant had looked up since arriving. The doctor put down her things and took a seat on the female side of the party's head table before quietly ordering a glass of white wine. Yili still hadn't touched her drink. She was far too engaged with her mechanical distraction. Just as the captain was ready to take his seat again, a slender young woman in a uniform very similar to Yili's jumped up and down and waved across the room. Jason! Jason Hunter! Is that you? She ran with her hands outstretched directly towards the captain. He had just enough time to recognize Zoni Tixia before she jumped into his arms and the two spun in circles with her feet lifted off the floor. One would have thought they were newly engaged by the bubbly energy of the girl's laugh. Her short pink hair only added to the sweetness of the scene. I haven't seen you in so long. I've got so much to tell you. You just won't believe it all. Well, I'm glad to see you too, Zoni, Hunter roared. I think you've grown since last time. You stop that, she chirped, whapping his shoulder. I'm still almost as old as you. Hunter pulled out a chair for her. What will you have? A margarita in the biggest glass they can find. Outstanding, Hunter snapped his fingers. Ray. Zoni took Moody's hands and squeezed them, whispering a cheery greeting. She did the same for Dr. Doverly. Most who saw Zoni Tixia alongside the rest of Hunter's party would have suspected she wasn't quite the same as the others, and they would have been right. Tixia was only three-quarters human. Her paternal grandmother hailed from a vaguely elf-like humanoid race native to one of the Reach worlds. It gave her skin an understated shiny quality and a color just a bit pinker than human skin should be. Among the benefits of being not entirely human, Tixia had perfect pitch and hearing more sensitive than a bloodhound wearing a directional microphone. On her shoulder was the blue and white patch of the Signals Corps, and like Yili, her collar was decorated with a senior lieutenant's insignia. Besides Hunter, she was also the only other officer at the table with the crossed bronze shotguns of the Indian Forks campaign affixed to her uniform. However, unlike Hunter, Tixia's decoration included a sapphire palm device. She had been asked on many occasions to tell the story, but up to now she never had. Apparently, the captain had surreptitiously put plans into motion right after Zoni arrived, because after taking his seat and having his old fashioned glass refilled with impeccably aged amber colored liquor, the food began to arrive. A platter of roasted chicken surrounded by dippable vegetables was placed right next to an enormous tureen of vegetable soup and a stack of large, fat-handled cups. On the opposite side of the chicken platter, a carved roast appeared moments later. Everyone was presented with a plate and utensils before Hunter tapped his glass with a fork a few times. The sound got the attention of his officers and more than a few close bystanders. I'd like to take a moment to tell you all how much I appreciate your responding to my hastily arranged party invitation. I only have one piece of official business to conduct before we all get far too undressed and involved in the evening's food and drink. I've put in requests to transfer all of you to my command aboard the Argent. 
Just like that, huh? Zoni teased. One of the perks of being a captain, Hunter replied with another boyish smirk. Skywatch Command has signed off, but I figured I'd still need to get you all appropriately inebriated before the night's over so as to avoid a mutiny before we even get back to the ship. Honora stifled a laugh. So let's see who's in. Hunter reached into his pocket and produced a shining painted titanium playing card. The Ace of Spades. He showed it to everyone at the table. Zoni smiled and rested her chin on her fists. Hunter put the card down in the center of the table. Major? Lucas produced a similar card. His was the Jack of Clubs. He placed it on the table, covering most of the ace, but leaving the black A and the suit in the corner visible. Right there with you, Cap. Zoni stretched, reaching up and out with her slender arms as if yawning. Before she leaned her elbows on the table again, she pretended to snatch the Jack of Diamonds out of her pink hair. She twirled it in two fingers and placed it on the other two cards, forming a three-card fan. Honora retrieved the Jack of Hearts from her leather folio and gently added it to the hand. Yili continued playing with her little mechanism while the others waited. Several moments passed. Lucas grinned. He half expected the strangely quiet girl to do something unique. Sure enough, the Jack of Spades slid out of a slot in the device. Yili placed it on the other four cards and took a sip of her drink before going back to playing with the device. She didn't say a word. Always was a tough hand to beat, Cap, Lucas said with a wink. The Jacks are back, Zoni added. Then let's celebrate. The doctor gets first choice. You're the guest of honor after winning your search and rescue badge. Lucas banged on the table while Zoni and the captain and more than a few bystanders cheered. Yili smiled and Honora blushed. Hunter picked up the carving utensils and started with the roast. Chapter 6 Roaring laughter punctuated story after story from all five members of the Argent's newly minted officer corps. More than a couple Skywatch non-coms and plebs asked Commander Doverly for her autograph. Lucas showed off the titanium poker hand they had made for themselves during their tenure as Yellowjacket pilots. He told and retold the story of how Yellowjacket 9 developed a reputation for stealing victory from the jaws of defeat and first became known as the Bandits. It wasn't until Jason's Ace Award they decided to rechristen themselves the Bandit Jacks and emblazon playing card insignia on all their ships. The squadron flew together for over a year, racking up victory after victory until the first-generation Yellowjacket fighter configuration was retired and Hunter was promoted to commander. Meanwhile, it wasn't often the rank and file got to meet an honest-to-goodness SR command officer. Aside from fleet, rumor had it there were only a dozen or so on active duty, with the rest of the wing comprised of medics, pilots, and cybernetic specialists. Zoni was asked to dance more than once and graciously obliged, eventually finding herself recruited into a group to learn how to dance to what Hunter explained was country music. Yili won several bets with both Marines and fleet crewmen over who could field strip and reassemble her blaster pistol the quickest. The OCE lieutenant's best time was just 19 seconds, which left several of the young men both dumbfounded and slightly poorer for their trouble. Yili used her winnings to buy dessert, consisting of an oversized sundae dish heaped with chocolate ice cream. The captain held court, flirting with the girls, high-fiving the guys, downing one drink after another and having a loud, cheerful good time of it. He would often interrupt the revelry to make an announcement while pointing to one of his officers, which would result in another cheer going up while the assembled all raised their glasses and enjoyed another drink together. Hunter's comlink alert went off. The sharp red light was instantly noticeable even in the crowded bar. A moment later, an all-business Skywatch officer appeared at the table. Captain Jason Hunter? He looked up at the young brunette. She was obviously not here for the party. That's me. Hunter replied with a grin. She saluted and handed him a sealed transmittal chip. I have new orders for you, sir. The captain took the locked container and looked at her with a confused expression. She saluted again. He returned the gesture before she turned on her heel and left the bar. He fumbled with the channel selector on his comlink. Finally, the indicator switched over. Argent to captain. Hunter here. Sir, ComSat reports reception of a 16-part scrambled flash message on fleet priority frequency keyed to your identifier. Code 00 black. I say again, code 00 black. Zoni was already at his side. Lucas put his arm around Hunter's shoulders and cradled his half-empty stein. What do you got there, Cap? That's a disaster signal, Zoni said quietly. 
A moment later, her comm link lit up. Moody pulled a buzzing handheld radio out of his pocket and checked the readout. Then Yilly's communicator started blinking. Honora was already in communication with someone on her headset. The music, laughing and dancing, continued around them, but for the five senior Skywatch officers, the world had changed in the space of only a few seconds. I think the party's over, Major. Chapter 7 Less than sixty seconds after the communication from the Argent Bridge, the bandit jacks were racing through an abandoned fuel station terminal. They had only moments to gather what they had brought with them. Hunter made the decision to try and find a shortcut through the darkened and supposedly secured facility, and he was cursing himself every step of the way now that the clock was ticking. Command One was less than two hundred yards away, but every time they turned in the right direction, they found a locked door. Walls, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Remember when I said you were on your way to a real command? Well, this is it. Signal emergency condition two. Notify engineering, I want all the fires lit. Alert section chiefs, I want to muster the crew on flight deck one thirty minutes after we hit the jump gate. Acknowledge. Affirmative, sir. What is your status? We will board command one in three minutes and rendezvous with Argent on your next orbit. Hunter out. The ad hoc landing party rounded another corner and found stacked metal boxes in front of twin warehouse doors. Blocked again, Moody shouted. He put his hands on his knees and tried to catch his breath. I don't believe this, Hunter barked. The sound echoed in the abandoned hallways. The others stood hesitantly for a moment before Yili wordlessly took action. She drew her blaster, turned it sideways to change settings, and then took aim. Wait, what are you... The percussive sound and searing bright light shook the small side corridor like a metal cabinet falling down a flight of stairs. The engineer fired again and again, tearing huge fiery holes in the empty containers as one bolt of reddish energy after another exploded through the tangle of debris. Within seconds, a six-foot ragged exit had been torn in the doors. Molten steel dripped from its edges. Well, I suppose that's one way to do things, Hunter quipped. If you can't find an unlocked door, make one. Yili holstered her weapon and gestured to the others with a hand as if showing them out. Hunter stepped over the sharp, hot pieces of wreckage as quickly as possible. The others followed. Once past the loading doors, the group ran across the tarmac through the night air. Cold lights glowed from the corners and roof lines of the buildings. In the distance, they could still hear the music from Scaries. Neek, this is Hunter. Scramble all systems for immediate dust-off. The captain held a hand to his ear as the group ran towards the waiting shuttle. Affirmative, Captain. Command 1 liftoff prep countdown 35 seconds and counting. DSS Argent is reporting emergency condition 2. Surface scanners have picked up possible weapons fire in our defense perimeter. Are you in any danger? Negative, Command 1. Stand by for liftoff. I'll have a briefing when we hit system's edge. The group arrived at the shuttle's hatch all at once. Neek deployed the ladders and one by one the Argent's officers piled aboard. Hunter scrambled inside and sealed the hatch. Sorry about your party, Doc. That's okay, Captain, Honora replied as she laced up and snapped her power harness into position across her shock couch. I know how painful it was for you to leave all that good scotch behind. Everybody in? Hunter asked as he quick configured the flight controls. The engine spun up rapidly. Punch it, Skipper, Moody shouted. Command One bounded into the sky on a superheated jet of thruster exhaust and then rocketed almost straight up. In moments, the tiny ship had reached a velocity of just under ten miles a second. Hunter to Argent. Go. Patch us to CIC and report all contacts. A moment passed. CIC to Hunter. Negative contacts. SRS is clear. No further updates since the original ComSat bulletin. Very well, Argent. Navigation, give me a position report. Azimuth 260. Estimated time to intercept your escape track is three minutes. Stand by to lock ILS. Approach control will key Horizon LOS data link and intercept closure in five, four, three. Oh, wow. Everyone leaned forward to look out the starboard ports of Command One. Within moments, the impressive shadow of the battleship Argent emerged from behind Jupiter 5 and approached their position, growing larger as it orbited along the edge of the planet's atmosphere. The moment the huge vessel's antennas cleared line of sight, the shuttle's navigation systems all switched over to automatic. Hunter secured them and swiveled his pilot seat. Time to introduce yourselves to my ship and lock your codes. All four of the other officers nodded and murmured their agreement. Neek, engage Argent's command computer. Scramble signal and authenticate Hunter. 
Captain Jason M. Identifier Victory 7715. Match voice print. Stand by for record write and confirm. Affirmative. Identity Captain Hunter. Jason M. Confirmed. Argent is standing by for new orders. Stand by to authenticate assignment to Executive Officer Post, DSS Argent. Voice print follows. Captain Hunter nodded to Anora. She cleared her throat gently. Commander Doverly, Anora C. Identifier Marigold 9056. Affirmative, Executive Officer Commander Doverly, Anora C. Officer posted. Stand by to authenticate assignment to Commander Marine Ground Forces, DSS Argent. Voice print follows. Major Moody, Lucas R. Identifier Thunderbolt 0105. Affirmative, Commander, Marine Ground Forces Major Moody, Lucas R. Officer posted. Stand by to authenticate assignment to Chief Signals Officer, DSS Argent. Voice print follows. Lieutenant Tixia, Zoni, Identifier Hummingbird, 8877. Affirmative, Signals Officer Tixia, Zoni, Officer posted. Stand by to authenticate assignment to Chief Engineer, DSS Argent. Voice print follows. Lieutenant Yili Curtis, Identifier Ghost 2946. Affirmative, Chief Engineer, Yili Curtis, Officer posted. All right, boys and girls, now you've got keys to the executive washroom. Let's get aboard and get situated. I'm mustering the crew in 20 minutes to announce our orders. The quartermaster will show you where you can park and stow your gear for the time being. By now, the Argent filled the forward viewports. Its tractor beams were guiding the shuttle to Flight Deck 3. The four new officers stared quietly. They had been told stories about the new Citadel battleships, but being told about a ship and then flying under it into a flight bay the size of five football fields was something else entirely. The flashing red alert indicators, however, left precious little time to be awestruck. Chapter 8 Skipper It wasn't often Lucas Moody found himself rushing to keep up with his somewhat shorter commanding officer, but this was one of those times. Sir, I need a moment. We've got a crew briefing, Major. I'm short on time here. Hold on a second, old man, Lucas said assertively. He pulled on Hunter's arm to slow him down and get his attention. The captain looked both impatient and terribly nervous. What exactly is going on here, sir? We're not even five years out of flight school. You're five pounds of officer wearing a hundred pounds of brass, and you're about to bring a room of nearly 700 people to attention. Now I realize we scored a few touchdowns flying the jacks, but all this? Moody gestured at the spotless metal walls of the corridor around them. This ship should be under the command of a guy old enough to be our grandfather. I'm technically not at liberty to discuss it, Moo. You've been ordered to keep quiet? Negative, just encouraged. What is all this anyway? Captains normally do this kind of briefing on the intraship. Hunter looked even more impatient. I have some co-stars in the flight bay I can't put on video, Moo. This isn't just about a briefing. This is about making a statement to everyone watching. Including our enemies, wherever they might be. Moody took a deep breath and exhaled. His urgency had abated somewhat. With all due respect, sir, if I'm going to lead second paladins into harm's way, I need to know we're all on the same page here. I'm betting the rest of the jacks are going to agree. Hunter hesitated. He knew well the difference between Moo's expression during a party in a bar and the look he wore now. This was their business, and if he couldn't have his senior staff's trust, this stays with us, understand? Hunter locked gazes with the Marine officer. Moo nodded attentively. There's been a schism in the upper Skywatch ranks over the past three years. Half the flag officers are convinced Fleet isn't doing enough to prepare for hostilities along Gitarn. The other half have been spending time and budgets painting the first group as alarmists and trying to sabotage their plans. It all came to a head right after the last council election and the appointments to replace two key members of Joint Supreme Command. I remember reading quite a bit about that, Lucas said quietly. Open war broke out on the council floor, and the split vote forced the highest-ranking ally of the so-called alarmists into early retirement. All the officers that had publicly supported him were singled out by the opposing flag officers. Most were stripped of their commands. Skywatch lost almost 40 captains in a matter of a few months. It got so bad some of their ships were decommissioned, all to prove a point. The cooler heads at fleet need to gain ground and also need to avoid anyone likely to be a target for the more numerous anti-alarmist faction. Unfortunately, that means pretty much everyone above the rank of lieutenant. And you're the new poster boy. Moo's expression lit up as he assembled the puzzle pieces. No wonder they promoted you so fast. It's why they promoted all of us so fast, Hunter replied. 
This plan's been underway for two years. What we did with the squadron earned us just as many enemies as friends, and now we're right smack in the middle of the spotlight. Everything this ship does, good or bad, is going to be used against us. I've been advised to get as far away from the core systems as possible to avoid saboteurs and spies until I can hammer this crew into a team. Skywatch flag officers plotting sabotage against one of their own ships. Hunter nodded. It's gotten that bad. There are two people at fleet I can trust and one of them might be aboard the missing ship we've been ordered to locate. I'm sorry I asked, sir. Now you know why I requested you and the others, Major. There may be people aboard this ship with orders to kill us. I need officers I can trust. Moo's expression hardened. You need to tell the others. Hunter nodded and put his hand on the taller Marine's shoulder. A wordless exchange said everything the two brothers-in-arms needed to say. They both headed for the flight bay. Chapter 9 Despite Flight Deck 1's seven-acre area and its five-story high ceilings, the murmur of hundreds of people engaged in hundreds of conversations was loud enough to fill the precisely filtered air with a dull roar. A row of Tarantula Hawk gunships was arranged behind the seating for the Argent crew, and Wildcat fighters were parked on opposite sides of the dais, set up for the crew address. The vessels were a reminder to everyone present the magnitude of the firepower at the command of the young skipper. In light of the non-public political situation, they were also meant to remind anyone with designs against Hunter or his ship what they were up against. Argent's majestic raptor-adorned logo was emblazoned on the wall behind the speaker's platform, and a royal blue banner depicting Captain Hunter's rank insignia and the Argent's designation was draped across the front of the lectern. At the precise moment the briefing was set to begin, the Marine Sergeant stationed at the egress hatch closest to the platform barked the command to come to attention loud enough to pierce the noise. The abrupt sound of an entire battleship watch snapping their heels together exploded like a rifle bullet and echoed twice. It was suddenly quiet enough to hear Captain Hunter's footsteps on the deck. He arrived at the lectern and set down his tablet. Be seated. A short burst of noise preceded total silence once again. I have ordered a standing yellow alert. A careful murmur quickly subsided. A Gitarn sensor beacon in Sector 8 last reported a transponder reception from the starship Dunkirk over 60 hours ago. The Dunkirk is a strike cruiser with a crew of 200 officers and men. Vice Admiral Hughes is in command. He is in the sector to show the flag and establish a forward post from which to observe activity along the reach. Since the Sector 8 contact, there has been no sign of the Admiral's ship or any other contacts in that region of space. Hunter paused. The crew listened attentively and silently. I have orders to navigate to the last known position of the Dunkirk and conduct search and rescue operations. There may be hostile forces in the area. We are authorized to defend ourselves and any friendly vessels. We will enter Gitarin space in approximately 28 hours. Between now and then, our new department chiefs will schedule four sets of combat readiness drills, one for each watch. The captain closed his tablet. I realize we're still a shakedown ship with a shakedown crew, but I expect all of us to perform to the best of our ability. This is a battleship. Let's make sure nobody forgets it. The sergeant barked again and the crew returned to attention. Hunter gathered the items off the lectern and stalked off the platform. Have the senior staff assembled in my inboard cabin in ten minutes? Aye, sir, the battalion marine replied. The captain stalked down the corridor. Chapter 10 the officers of the Argent sat together in a contemplative silence. You requested transfers for all of us to protect us, Zoni finally replied after listening to Captain Hunter's short briefing. That's one way to look at it, Hunter replied. The five pilots were seated around the captain's luxurious conference table. Behind Hunter's chair was a spectacularly colorful real-time map of the Gitern Reach, lit up in glowing vector graphics projected on a transparent 12-foot-high slab of dense reactive crystal. At the lower edge, a small replica of the Argent's flag crept along towards the sprawling asteroid field that separated the core systems from the rest of space. Next to the Avatar was a readout of the ship's position and designation. I haven't had time to do a complete control check yet, but if your stories about your sister are accurate, you might want to take her up on that robot offer, Yilly said evenly. The last thing we need is a concussion charge popping off in our life support circuitry during a critical situation. We should rig the ship to catch any saboteurs in the act, Moo offered. That could take days, Anora replied. 
I think we should be careful not to start second-guessing ourselves, and we definitely shouldn't be running here and there preparing for potential enemies when there are plenty of real ones. Zoni and Yili nodded. Agreed, Exo. I want all of you armed until further orders. Each of you will quietly select one person from your department you can trust. Tell them I've ordered an unusual drill and they need to be prepared to take over for you at a moment's notice. Moo, I want you to recruit 15 Marines you know well. Order them to shadow each of us two by two in shifts. Don't make it too obvious. Moo nodded. No officers. Quietly keep ship security on emergency condition one even if we stand down from quarters, understood? Aye, sir. The Comsat console beeped. Hunter. Captain, we have a new contact designated Mockingbird 114 bearing 319 Mark 7, range 22 million miles. Identification? Negative, sir. Navicomp thinks it's a sensor echo. Battle computer thinks it's a ship. Signals isn't reading a transponder in any known frequency range. It appears to be moving, but we can't establish a track. Energy emissions are present, but spectrometry is inconclusive. Are we active? Negative. We haven't lit it up yet. All scanners and sensors are on passive readings only per your orders. All right, put a pin in it and start a tape. I'll be up in a... Captain, unidentified contact has just changed course. Threat board just went active. Battle computer reports Mockingbird 114 now hostile. Shift designation to Kilo X-Ray 1. Now vectoring 156 on intercept course and closing. The channel clicked. Sir, this is Skywatch on emergency intraship. Combat STC reports hostile contact Kilo X-Ray 1 now inside our defense perimeter. Hunter was already on his feet. Signal the officer of the watch to sound general quarters, all hands to battle stations. A moment later, the clear channel alarm sounded over all communications channels. A pleasant female voice echoed through the intraship address system. Attention all hands, attention all hands. Officer of the watch has signaled general quarters. The klaxon began echoing. All the lights shifted to a hellish red glow, and the five members of the bandit jacks stood around the conference table wearing expressions common to all soldiers about to join battle. All hands man your battle stations. Repeat. All hands man your battle stations. Time out two minutes. Deck officers report alert status to the first officer. See you on the beach, sir, Moo said calmly. The Argent's officers rushed out the door with Hunter in the lead.